Graham, thank you so much. That's an, another kind of very powerful talk. Um, I'm going to ask all the, all the speakers could put their um, videos on now, actually. Um, we've, we've only got one question in the Q&A. There's so much to talk about. It's almost hard to know where to begin now, isn't it? Um, and like three powerful slices through profound problems in, in, in the way that we're, well, failing to respect the natural world, failing to respect the relationships between animals and plants, failing to respect the kind of innate aspects of our biology and the natural world. Um, the one question that's there, so just, I wonder, I think this might have been a response to something that you said, Belle, so I don't know whether you um, would like to answer this online, but it's, the question is, what is the source of the statistic that 50% of greenhouse gases come from animal farming? Um, are you chasing that down, should we? <laughs> so, um, do you want to, you 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 don't need to rush if you like, and we can, I can I can take the conversation between us into a different way, or are you ready? You need to turn your microphone on. I can do my best. I'm not sure if Natalie also has any thoughts about it. The fifty-one percent. Um, I, I think, I mean, I, I have seen that figure, but I think um, the Vegan Society, for example, talks about 16%. And I think yeah. that's um, probably, you know, there are lots of different ways of calculating these things, but I think that's probably a, a more realistic measure. Um, yeah. The problem is, of course, you know, uh, how do you calculate um, the refrigeration, various things like that. But I think I, I would say if you ask me to say a figure off the top of my head, 16, one six is the figure that I would use. Yeah. So, so the stat comes from um, a, uh, a an academic called Robert Goodland, um, who who wrote a report, and he he said in an article for the New York Times the key difference between the eighteen percent, which is a, the, the more conservative, or it, it kind of goes ups and downs, and the fifty one percent figures is that the latter accounts for how exponential growth in livestock production accompanied by large-scale deforestation and forest burning have caused a dramatic decline in the earth's photosynthetic capacity along with large and accelerating increases in, in volatile oh my god i can't say it, uh, volatilization of soil carbon um uh, and this is the book that I'm getting it from, and, and he discusses it, and he sort of, sort of feels that he he wants to uh, Jonathan Safran for, for towards the 51 percent. It is a a bonkers figure. I know bonkers. It sounds bonkers, and yet I think it sort of captures just how multi symptomatic animal agriculture can be. I'm also very wary of figures. I think we know it's not good for the planet intensive animal agriculture. And I think it needs to, you know, we really need to, to scale it back. Um, but yes, I agree. The 51% is a shocker if it's, if it's, you know, true. Alicia, did you want to come in? Uh, yeah, I wanted to add a bit to what Natalie said, um, because I think the uh, two things really, one is that the, the effect of um, genetic modification on uh, the third world is uh, huge because it completely destroys their system of agriculture, which is seed sharing and biodiversity. And by the um, corporations trying to patent certain plants, um, they're actually stopping that system of seed sharing. Um, and that's where most of the food is grown. So that's, I mean, there's, they've caused an absolute disaster in the third world um, okay. with, yeah, with yeah, hundreds of um, farmers oh, committing suicide. Uh, and it's, uh, it is a, it is a good, plot it's of good. the commons, really. It's in, in it's a, it's a video. If I can just come back on that, I mean, that's absolutely right. And I think yeah. um, this is particularly thinking about cotton farmers in India, um, where there has been huge issues. I think one of the th reasons why 
that's quite a well-known argument. And what the other side will say in response is, oh, but we, you know, what about if we um, if we do it for good purposes? And the famous example of this, which is always being cited at me, is golden rice. And the idea is this is a patent that's been handed over for public use and it puts vitamin A into rice. But the problem with this is that it ignores the practical reality that um, children and children do go blind because they don't have vitamin A in their diet, but they don't have vitamin A in their diet because they don't eat any vegetables. They essentially only eat rice. Um, and if they're deficient in vitamin A in those circumstances, they're also going to be deficient in a whole range of other nutrients. So if you're going to say, what do we do about this? The answer has to be to give those children and their parents access to vegetables and fruit um, so that they actually get a balanced, healthy diet. And the other thing to say is you think about the economics of this. If you do a big um, publicity campaign to say, hey, golden rice is great. Golden rice makes your children healthy. Golden rice becomes more expensive. The children that need it most are going to not going to be able to afford golden rice. Um, and so you always have to look at these things in a complete socioeconomic and cultural framework, um, not just say, oh, gosh, we've got some children who um, are suffering terribly and it's, it's a terrible disaster from vitamin A deficiency leading to blindness. We'll find some way to get vitamin A in it's the golden silver bullet solution. You know, this is the golden way to fix things by solving one thing without looking at the whole system. Can I ask you a question of, or, I mean, Natalie's just got 15 minutes left and um, and you may all have questions for each other, but as, as more an outsider, ignorance about all of these things, really, I'm getting these kind of different pictures of, of profound problems in 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 our environment in our treatment of the natural world and and i mean when you were talking natalie at the beginning about the kind of well i mean you framed it in terms of the lack of expertise in parliament but you also just might say the lack of will in the political system and and the corrupting influence of power money and the corporations yeah. which drive the mechanisms itself and so you know, I, I know we're all living through this, but I mean, where's the hope for building an alternative power base, whether it's to find out why metal is being poured on the soil or whether, you know, it's about actually what interference is being made to natural uh, animals or all of those things in between. How do we, and I'd be just interested in everybody. I mean, Natalie, if you went first, because you might have to go, but I mean, that's the, the battle we're engaged in, isn't it? It's, it's not just public awareness, as Grant talks about. It's, it's changing the power system in some way, isn't it? Very much so. And what's really exciting, you know, if you want to go to three days of total encouragement and seeing things done differently, there's the Oxford Real Farming Conference. I have to put stress on the real because there's two that run in parallel at the same time, the Oxford Farming Conference, which is the NFU mainstream one and the Oxford Real Farming Conference, which is the alternative one. And you'll see three days there of people showing how they're growing food very differently. Some of the organisations you might like to look at is the Land Workers Alliance, which is you might call this the other side of the NFU, the National Farmers Union. Um, there's, um, I heard speaking there at a book that I'd highly recommend um, titled Miraculous Abundance. Um, and forgive my French accent, but it's about a farm called Le Bec Halloween uh, in Normandy. And they took quite a small area of very bog standard arable um, industrially farmed land and turned it to this incredibly rich production of vegetables and fruit um, and off a thousand square meters we're producing a decent income and a huge amount of nutrition you know one of the things we need to think about is nutrition per hectare being produced rather than calories per hectare um, there's things like incredible edible in Todmorden um, there's um, in there's been research done in Sheffield that showed that if you grew you could take a reasonable amount of the green spaces in Sheffield and we could make Sheffield by growing within the city boundaries more than 120% self-sufficient in vegetables and fruit. Um, so all of these things are happening. Um, the Transition Towns movement has done lots of exciting things. Um, there's um, a group in Manchester called the Kindling Trust, um, which trains people to be small um, 
growers um, trains them as economically as well as um, in terms of agronomically. Um, so there's a huge amount of stuff to, going on. And there's also in mainstream agriculture, a great deal of interest in what's known as regenerative agriculture. Um, and I went to the big field days to that for the first time. And it's where sort of traditional large scale mainstream agriculture is starting to meet um, the other alternative. And one of the things we find is that I've seen over years of going to the Oxford Real Farming Conference is that um, there's more and more people who sneak down from the NFU one and kind of sneak into the back and listen to the issues, people interested in soils, looking after soils. So there is a general shift, but the overlying problem is there's lots of farmers who'd like to change, but the dominance of the supermarkets, the dominance of the, the as you were identifying, Simon, multinational food processing companies. We really have to break the economic model. Um, it's the problem is not underlying the farmers. Um, you know, they don't want to trash the soil. They understand, you know, these issues, um, but they're trapped in systems. I visited a, um, a, a guy growing maize over in Shropshire um, with the Wildlife Trust. He was running various trials to plant uh, legumes, under, so plants that generate nitrogen in the soil underneath his maize and to stop, uh, to keep structure in the soil and protect his soil. But we went along these different trial plots and he said, you know, this fetch, the seed costs 12 pounds a kilo, this clover, the, the costs X and Y, and nothing that I paid for my maize is enough to do this at any kind of scale. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it's system change, not climate change. I've been chanting on more demonstrations than I get to remember. This is very much the case in terms of food, that it's not a case of waving the fingers at farmers and saying, you've got to do things differently. We've got to enable them and, and make it possible for them. And, you know, we took away all, the, all of the, in England, we've taken away all the government um, advice on farming. Um, the only people they have to, to go advice for are the, are the multinational seed companies and the multinational chemical companies and the multinational fertilizer companies. That's where most of the advice to farmers comes from. So we've got to actually look at ways of restoring different ways of doing things and again it's happening at small scale stepping up to kind of medium scale um but we're still not seeing the transformation of the countryside that we need thanks natalie bell would you like to just comment on this issue of the power and the systems and then maybe graham you might come in and reflect on it too yeah, I mean, when I, you know, when I was listening to 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 Natalie's talk about um, gene editing, I couldn't help thinking about carbon CSS, uh, carbon storage, carbon capture, carbon capture storage, and and how these sort of technological panaceas were being presented, and yet the solutions are right there in nature itself. And, and and I think the reason why these technological panaceas are being presented, pushed so hard, uh, they're often being pushed by large companies who see a great deal of profit, potential profit in them. And so, so, so the situation is being very, very skewed for us. I think, I think what Natalie says about, I mean, certainly since running, starting the Climate Centre, I've seen so many groups just within my my borough alone, really trying to come up and tackle the issue um, and provide alternative narrative, alternative solutions. You know, it's actually very, very heartening. Someone once said that, you know, you've got this 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 layer of bureaucracy and, and multinational corporation, but underneath is this mycelium network of groups and individuals who are coming up to rise, they're rising up now. I can feel it, <laughs> really, I really can. The hope and I have for, for, for this for this is, it, it's there. Um, there was something else I was going to say, actually, um, but it's passed me by for now. If I remember it, I'll come back to it. Sorry, Sam. No problem. We can rotate round a little bit more. But that's okay. Or do you oh, remember? One, one thing. There is a there is a focus. I, I mentioned the Citizens Assembly before, and I do think this is a fantastic alternative democratic structure that people in their own communities can put in play now. So, for example, if we if we hosted just this meeting in a slightly different way, more people who are engaged in this topic, greater line of experts, and then and then and sort of breaking down to okay, what do you want to see in your local area, and how are we going to make it happen, um, and, and then they get concrete responses to the talks that we've had tonight. I think these this is a very exciting potential for, for answering uh, this bizarre de democracy that we're sort of labouring under at the moment. That, that's just handing us government after government that isn't responding to our issues at all. Thank you, Belle. 
Um, Graham, do you want to reflect a little? I mean, obviously, you your talk talked about the frustrations of almost the lack of engagement. I mean, what's your sense of a way forward through this? And what do we, as a society, what do we do when we've got a problem it's, like it, this that people aren't? I mean, so, society's changing. You know almost by the day you know we we really do have to get a grip of what's going on around us i mean you know we're small time farmers ourselves we, we have many different things that we get involved in and farming is just one um you know we, we we do things a little bit differently here and we're very uh, careful what we do with our animals and um, we're very loving to them as well at, at the same time we're animal lovers um mm -hmm. and I'm lucky, I suppose I'm lucky in one respect because I have a huge network of farmers and landowners that I know I speak to on these topics. But you do get the sense sometimes that you, your words are a little bit lost. Um, you know, the, the problems that I see and I experience out there on the, on the many acres of land here in, in, in the UK, uh, you know, a lot of people don't, don't believe it, don't, don't, don't understand it. They don't... Um, Sometimes they don't even believe that we're, we're finding these huge amounts of metallic waste um, buried across, you know, many acres of farmers' farmers' fields in every county. Um, so so a, awareness raising from our side is going to be a very, very slow process. It's almost um, like me, my voice against, against many others. Um, you know, the MPs are not really keen on, on getting involved in it for whatever reason. Um, um, even our own metal detecting community uh, we have something called the National Council of Metal Detecting. They're only just now waking up to the fact that this is going on and they're starting to raise a little bit of awareness through their, their own ways and means. But uh, we, we need to act. We need to be acting very, very quickly because, um, like I said in the, in the speech that I did earlier, you, you, know, you think the plastics in the sea is a big issue. Well, you want to see what we're digging up. I mean, we could, we could quite easily fill, fill you know, huge bins full of this metallic waste within within a matter of days, and and that's only just scraping the surface. Now it can't be right that we're growing this horrendous amount of metallic waste and some of these real nasties in amongst our in amongst our crops and our food chain. It's just not on. It's just absolutely ridiculous. So I'm hoping when the BBC, I've got a meeting with the BBC on Monday. Um, I'll just have to dedicate a little bit of time to speak to the lady there at Country File, and I'm hoping that we can do it in such a way that we can we can. Uh, you know, raise awareness through the television, but we don't want to be getting, like, at the same time, we're going to be careful because we don't want to be getting people into trouble. We've already had a little bit of friction off some farmers already uh, using social media to get the word out there about this metallic waste. Um, and I guess these are probably farmers that have got it on their land and, and are frightened that somebody's going to come door knocking and say, listen, you've got it on your land, we need to get it off and it's going to cost you X amount of thousands of pounds to do that. So we've just got to be very, very careful how we raise the awareness, but we can't just sit on our hands and do nothing. Somebody's got to stick their head above the parapet. And unfortunately at the moment, it's going to be me, but um, I just, I'm just that passionate about it. And I feel that compelled that every time I venture onto a field full of this metallic waste, that I just know there's an injustice going on. It's just not right. It's just horrendous, absolutely horrendous. If I'm walking back to my pickup or my Land Rover with pockets full of, of aluminium waste that are coming off fields that are growing crops in, um, and that's just me in, in, a, in a matter of hours. You imagine a team of detectorists on there, how much we would uncover. It's horrendous. It's absolutely horrendous. Needles, hypodermic needles, batteries, MDF, plastics, rubber. You know, they can't use, these people cannot use the countryside as a dumping ground. It's just wrong. It's just plain wrong. So we're going to start a, a awareness raising at the lowest level possible. If that means using social media, we'll do that. Um, and we'll just see if the campaign grows and grows but we do need help and support that's the that's the that's the other thing there's this repeated trope isn't there of like when we hear bad news the first thing we want to do is not hear the bad news i know yeah at all sorts of levels even not just kind of from self-interest natalie you I'm afraid I'm going to have to go for quite shortly, but um, I just wanted to react uh, directly to Graham. I've written down your email, Graham, and I will reach out after this. Um, but I, I mean, my initial thought is that this is part of a much broader issue. I'm just looking at a article in the ENDS report, which unfortunately is behind a uh, paywall. Uh, but the headline is when toxic waste devastated livestock on two Cumbrian farms. Um, so um, basically, 
sewage waste was spread on the farms. The cattle all got sick. Uh, they eventually had to stop production. Um, and I suspect this is a much, my initial thought is that the metal is just part of a broader amount, as you were saying, you know, rubber and all sorts of other things. Um, so I think there's a huge amount of stuff. There's a big issue with what's known as forever chemicals, PFAS um, and other related um, chemicals, which we now know are absolutely everywhere. Um, in every conceivable place. So I, I suspect this is part of a much broader issue. It's not just the metallic stuff. And just to sort of um, speak about how I frame this, it's not so much the case with the metals, but things like the PAFES, pesticides, um, lots of other the plastics. Um, these are what are known as novel entities um, in the framework of, of planetary boundaries. And I say for shorthand, those are plastics, pesticides and pharmaceuticals. Um, and the Stockholm Institute last year um, produced a report saying this was yet one other planetary boundary, as well as um, climate, as well as loss of nature, as well as geochemical flows, which is basically nitrogen and phosphorus. Um, we've expanded with beyond the planet's ability to take all these, these novel entities. And I suspect metals are not exactly novel entities, but they're part of that same kind of pollution story. And so that would be my understanding what's happening. That's what, if it, you know, I'm sorry, I'm going to have to go in a minute, but just if I can suggest a way of looking at this. Many people may know the book Donut Economics, um, uh, Kate Woolworth, um, and that is based on the, the idea of planetary boundaries. And I would say that we can't just think about climate, we can't just think about nature, we have to think about living within the physical limits of this one planet. Um, and, you know, this is food, I think, is a great way to get at this because everybody eats, everyone has some kind of interest in food. But we also have to make sure that everyone, the inside of the donut, is the human need, needs of the human beings on this planet. So what we have to do is feed people well, healthily, to give them a good quality of life. And, you know, what we're seeing now in UK and many other global North countries is life expectancy is actually going down. And our diet certainly has a significant factor in that. And our healthy life expectancy is going down possibly even faster. Um, so, you know, food is a great way to get to all these issues. And food is one of the fundamentals. So um, I think this is a really important area. So I think this has been a great discussion. And I'm really sorry that I have to nip off just before the end, but I, but I better go and catch a train. <laughs> Thank you so much, Natalie. Thank Thanks, you. Thanks, everyone. Thank Cheers. Thank yeah. Um, okay, and um, there are two que two more questions in the Q and A. Um, so one of the questions is from Jocelyn and John Plummer. Politicians come and go. We question their knowledge and commitment. Globally, is the United Nations gripping the serious issues you've raised? Um, I don't know if I mean I don't know if anybody has a response to that one. I was just thinking about in the field of disability, the United Nations and poverty. The United Nations has. Um, published very important reports, critical of the UK government, for instance, and the UK government has shrugged its shoulders and carried on, and the UK media doesn't pay much attention. So I don't think of the UN as actually having very much power, although I might be wrong, and it may have some important influence. It does have influence in other countries, in my experience. The European Union takes it a bit more seriously. What do people think about the role of the United Nations in all of this and or other global and kind of forms of governance? Just anything folk have uh, thought about? Yeah, so I am, uh, well, I mean, if we, if we think about it, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change is a United Nations body and it is, you know, the most respected um, sort of disseminator of, of really, of climate news. I mean, there are issues in that um, it often doesn't speak strongly enough to the issues. It is, you know, uh, influence. But but Antonio Guterres, at, at the head of the UN, is a is a very passionate and powerful speaker. But um, is it having huge impact? <laughs> I I don't know. It's it's not changing the world fast enough. You know, he is he is so forthright in his speeches, and yet big business and governments are not are not catching up. I'm going to just, uh, uh, Graham or Alicia, and ask you if you're less desperate to come in on this one, I was thinking Linda's question might be a good one to go to too, because this is a question about actually, I mean, Natalie was talking about it there really, the idea of a, a nutritious diet and the importance of that and the interrelationship of these issues to a nutritious diet for humans, I guess, but although actually that means a nutritious diet, everything i would suspect 
So the, there's a challenge here, I think, not maybe a direct challenge, but you know, a question mark about, in Linda's question, about do we really know what nutritious means? Are, the, uh, are we making assumptions maybe on both sides of the argument, if there are two sides of this argument, about what nutritious means? Any thoughts about this question? Well, um, Henry Dibble, Dimbleby produced a report that was actually commissioned by the government, but has been ignored by it, mm -hmm. about good food. And I think um, we, should, we should take that on board in our process of developing policies for good food. He had, um, I've only heard about it, I haven't read it myself, but my partner keeps urging me to do so because it's got so many good ideas about what is nutritious and what we should do. So I think that that must be a, a topic in this series sometime. That's a generous offer. Alicia's constructing a very detailed series of events. Uh, this is only number two, so we can yeah. perhaps return to this issue in, in a later call. Belle or Graham, any thoughts on nutrition? Um, yeah, I, I do. I think, well, I think we lead a patently very, very unhealthy diet at the moment. Um, you, you know, um, it's very, very salt and, and sugar heavy, and it, it, it is too meat heavy, even for the, the human body. I think, I think, what are the two big killers uh, in, in heart disease, I think, and cardiovascular issues are, are you know, almost directly related to overconsumption of, of meat products. Um, and I think, I, I think very few people would argue that we obviously have to have more fruit and vegetables in our diet. Um, how do you know what a healthy diet is? I think by the life expectancy of your population, about the general condition of your, 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 your population, I'd assume. Graham, do you want to weigh in on this from a farmer's perspective? I think... I think you, you only have to look around you how many obese people there are. I mean, that's that sounds quite cruel. Um, but it's it's the rise of the fast food outlets now. I mean, you know, most towns and cities, um, they seem to be on the increase rather than the decrease, which is a real shame. Um, you know, food, fast food is widely available, people seem to crave it. Um, health issues come off the back of of, of the of the craving for this these fast food outlets uh, I, I don't know where it's going to end i mean you know encouraging people to grow their own um in in limited space even um would be a way forward encouraging people to eat more fruit and vegetables has got to be um paramount into in, in making the nation healthier and i think we lost that a little bit i think you know even going back to when, when my grandfather was alive he was a, a huge grower of, of fruit and veg and most of his diet was made from what he grew uh, and that was passed on to my father, and I also, um, not as much as I should uh, grow my own, but we, you know, we're putting things in place now where we're getting polytunnels fitted, um, you know, uh, and I think it's the right way to go. I think, I think the reliance on supermarkets has got to be looked at. Um, you know, when there's these empty shelves situation going on, and um, people just, just sort of stare at, uh, you know, stare at uh, the, the ground and think, what are we going to do next? We've got to start getting the, you know, people educated in, in eating more fruit and veg and maybe just, you know, utilizing the space that people have to grow their own. It's got to be a fundamental thing that we should be doing and educating these people, mm -hmm. but it's very, very hard to do. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, we were talking to a group of, you know, young teenagers and young adults about fast food, not so long ago, actually. And it's very difficult to get the message across where, you know, they've been for a night out and a, and, and a you know, and the first thing they do when they wake up in the morning is, you know, they crave fast food uh, mm -hmm. to make them recover from the hangovers. Mm -hmm. um, and, that, and that is fundamentally what the problem is. We're up against such a barrier with these fast food joints. I mean, they're just opening up all over. I mean, it, here in our town in, in Dalton in Furness, we've got probably more fast food outlets here than anything else. Mm -hmm. You know, you walk down the high street and there's no old fashioned fruit and veg shops anymore or, even clothes shops or anything that you could walk into and enjoy having a five minute browse. It's all kebabs, pizzas, burgers, you know, chips, mm -hmm. fried chicken, Indians. It's just Chinese meals. It's just 
it's just a big problem. I mean, so yeah, education's the one, getting the message across how we're going to do it, though, it's going to be so difficult. It is. And I mean, these fast food, you know, these fast food uh, companies are really reliant, like I said, on these incredibly high salt and sugar contents, which renders almost every kind of, look, uh, you know, wholesome, good food, essentially tasteless you know it's, it's about reculturing our, our our taste buds away from from these these highly flavored foods which again unfortunately often contain the poorest quality meats and ingredients you know badly badly raised you know or badly killed animals it's it's, it's a you know whatever we have now it's not working um, and the current food system i would really urge us to seek constructive changes yeah, Cookie. I'll make a link. I put a link in the chat to our um, the UBI lab network that we set up, and there is a UBI lab food. And one of the, I mean, it's a hypothesis in a sense, but there is evidence for it, mm -hmm. is that poverty and income insecurity are also two really important factors in driving this kind of drive towards cheap um, and poor quality food. And so, uh, you know, I think that's, again, like the way the economy has changed and the way politicians have supported this shift. So lots and lots of people now no longer feel like they've got a secure income. Lots of people mm -hmm. now are in poverty. You can buy the worst food you can buy is the cheapest food you can buy. Yeah. yeah. You all know that. So the more inequality and poverty we create, which we're doing by political choice, and we drive that problem forward as well. So even education, I suspect, is probably not enough if if we don't provide people with the means to shift their behaviour as well. Um, but it's, we're approaching the end, and Linda's put another question in. Uh, the evidence that meat saturated fat is related to heart disease is unreliable. Sugar and refined carbohydrate is definitely the problem. Metabolic syndrome, diabetes leads to higher incidence of heart disease. The most likely healthy diet is real food, not processed, with plenty of vegetables and some animal produce. The essential fats and food. So I think, Linda, you're answering your question, aren't you? Which is probably sounds a very intelligent answer to me, who isn't an expert in this. So um, I'm going to. So with three minutes left, um, maybe, and we've got three speakers. So maybe you would like to just take a minute just to kind of um, a like final call to action or hint to people are here. I remember, all these things will be recorded. And also Alicia will take the transcript and that becomes part of a briefing note. And then all this will feed into the uh, development of a full range of grassroots policies for sustainability. Um, let's do it in reverse order, maybe, Graham. If what's your last message to go with? Well, at the very least, it's making people aware of the, of the growing problem of metallic waste. Um, being spread onto to our wonderful, our wonderful land. You know, we're getting conned really into thinking that we're driving past all these wonderful fields that the farmers are keeping really neat and tidy, which a lot of them do, and a lot of do, a lot of them do a fantastic job in that. But just under the surface, there's this horrendous lurking metallic mess that we we need to stop as soon as possible because it's going to get to a point where there's going to be studies made where they're going to be linking these high levels of aluminium. That, that are being grown in our food crops that are going to be linked to all sorts of diseases. I can just see it happening. It's just horrendous. So at the very least, it's all about awareness raising. If anybody wants to um, ask me any more questions, they can contact me by email. I give that earlier. And I just think this could be the start of us, you know, gently opening the door or shutting the door, um, I should say, to this horrendous situation that we're in. So um, thanks for listening and thanks for having me today. Thank you, Graham. Uh, last thought. Last thought is, yeah, we're really in a very, very um, uh, challenging moment in human history. And I think it's really important to hold on to that. And I think one of the responses to it has to be reframing the way that we see nature. So, so you know, stepping around techno fixes towards the fact that actually everything we need is truly out there if we know how to take care of it and treat it with respect. Um, uh, yeah, I, I just want to reiterate, we, we have a, a closing window of opportunity in which to address very, very serious issues. And I think we have to stay flexible in the way we think about things and open to new ideas and, and kind to each other and kind to other species. 
Thank you, Belle. Beautifully put. And Alicia, you started this process. What do you want to say to finish it? Well, I want to inject some um, hope uh, into the uh, ability to change, because I think um, all the, the issues are linked. Um, environmental destruction and uh, the collapse of the economy, social injustice, um, racialism, child abuse, all our social uh, problems are linked to a general respect, a general lack of respect for people and nature. And I think more and more people are um, aware of this. I know, don't know if they're yet aware of the links, but there, there's more and more protest. I mean, I, I would think we're aware of the power of, of um, the people at the top, but um, I like to think of um, Greta Thunberg's saying that uh, the, the real power is with the people because we do the jobs. We, we know about it. We actually keep the government in power. And strikes, the increasing number of strikes, could make um, life as we have it um, impossible. So I think what we need to do is to work out good policies to empower people to demand change. Um, and I, I think the growing number of, of um, people across the board um, complaining about the present situation, who are totally aware that the present situation is just not working for anybody, um, we should be encouraged by that and work with it. Thanks, Liz. Well, that's a perfect note from Citizen Network, which is all about actually reminding us that we are citizens. Um, or as Jarvis Cocker, the Sheffield pop star said, we're the common people, but that's we're the people that actually should have the power. So what it might take is a bit of organization as well. So I'd encourage you to uh, stay connected, join up with different groups. It's free to join Citizen Network as well and stay in touch with groups around the world working on these and other issues. I, I just want to end by thanking Alicia for organising the event and for Graham and Natalie and Belle. Great talks. I learned a loads. Um, I'm, I'm sure that others did too. And um, I'm sure this will have a really positive impact in all of the work we're doing together as we work on these projects. So a big thank you. Enjoy the rest of your evenings, everybody. I'm going to go and have some carrot and lentil soup now. So. Oh, that's good. <laughs> Bye, everyone. Bye. Thank you. Thank you, Simon. Pleasure. Pleasure.